Fibonacci was a, uh, an Italian mathematician uh, during the 13th century, and uh, arguably probably the most uh, accomplished mathematician during the Middle Ages. He was most noted for a book he wrote uh, titled Libra Abaci, which means the uh, Book of Calculations. The book had um, two, three sections. Three sections. The first section was um, arithmetic, using the uh, um, Arabic Hindu number system, which is the number system that we currently use. And um, the second section was on applications of that, <coughs> of that arithmetic skills, which had to do with um, commerce. And the third section were, uh, was about like recreational math problems from like ancient Greece and, and Asia, okay? So the first section on uh, arithmetic using the, the Hindu Arabic number system, um, well, before that, before the book came out, which is like around 1202 is when he started d distributing copies. Before that, um, Europe was using solely the Roman numerals. And Roman numerals was like, uh, you can't really do much with Roman numerals. You can't, um, you, you can't represent fractions with Roman numerals, right? So they're very limited. They're great for uh, enumerating Super Bowls and Olympic Games, but not so great for calculations, right? So, <clears throat> like I say, you just started distributing that copy around 1202, and by the year 1250, um, all of Europe was universally using the Hindu Arabic number system, which was, which was great for Europe, and yeah, they kicked the Roman numerals to the side, okay? All right, so <clears throat> the third section, which, which dealt with uh, recreational math problems, uh, he posts one problem called the uh, rabbit problem, okay? And the rabbit problem is what generates the uh, Fibonacci sequence, the famous Fibonacci sequence. So let's go ahead and have a look at that problem. So you start with a pair of rabbits, an infant pair of rabbits that consist of a, one male and one female, okay? Like little baby rabbits, right? Okay, so after one month, the rabbits will grow to adults, okay? A month after they become adults, um, they begin to reproduce, and they always reproduce a pair of rabbits, okay? And once they start reproducing, they reproduce every month after that. And they always reproduce a pair of rabbits consisting of male and female, okay? All right. <clears throat> and the rabbits never die. They just keep on living and living and living, okay? And they never die, all right? And uh, so his question was, how many pairs of rabbits will there be after one year, okay? So... Okay, so here we go. We start with the. Okay, all right. So we start with an uh, infant pair of rabbits. So this is a. Uh, we're going to go ahead and answer this question here. Okay, so month. Pairs of rabbits. Okay. Now this is the beginning of the month. So we had to go out to. 13 because at the beginning of the 13th month, that will complete a whole year, okay? So we have to go all the way out here. And I hope your arith <laughs> arithmetic skills are better than mine. <laughs> okay. All right. So the beginning month one, how many pairs of rabbits do we have? One, one pair of rabbits, okay. So what's gonna happen at the beginning of month two? Well, <laughs> this infant pair of rabbits will grow to adults. <laughs> see, see they're, they're, they're adults now. They're, they're all grown up. So the beginning of month two, we have still one pair of rabbits. Okay. Now, what's going to happen at, at the beginning of month three? Well, these two are going to reproduce, and now we have uh, <laughs> another pair of baby rabbits, right? So now we have two pairs, right? So at the beginning of month four, what's going to happen is these two here are going to grow to adults, and they're going to reproduce, right? So now we have three pairs of rabbits. Okay, so the beginning of month, uh, beginning of month five, 
These guys here are going to grow to adults, so they're going to come up here. These two here are old enough to start reproducing. So they're going to reproduce a pair of rabbits. They're going to become adults. So how, tell me how many pairs of rabbits we're going to have the next month. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, five, right? So these two have a pair. These will come up here to be adults. So it's going to be three adults, two pairs of baby rabbits, total of five, five rabbits, right? Okay. Okay, let's look at month six and see if we can see a pattern here. So what's going to happen? <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Plus, plus five <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're just populating. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, okay. So, yeah, we have five, right? Five. So these are going to come up here, adults. Come up, come up, adults, right? There you go, Chuck. Advance. Okay. And they're going to reproduce, right? So now we have three pairs of baby rabbits plus the initial, well, the five, five pairs of adults, right? So how many pairs of rabbits do we have now? Eight. Eight pairs of rabbits, right? So this is an example of a recursive sequence. A recursive sequence is one in which you can get the next term of a sequence by using previous terms in the sequence, right? So, look at two. How can we get two from the previous terms? Adam, right? One, one. Okay. Three. How can we get three? Two plus one. Five. Okay. There you go. Eight. Five, three. Can you guess? What's that going to be? Yeah, 13. Okay. That one? Twenty one, okay. Thirty-four. Um, fifty-five. Uh, eighty-nine. How's my arithmetic, Chuck? I'm doing all right? Good. 144. Is that good? Yep. Okay. Two thirty-three. Okay. So it'd be two hundred and thirty three pairs of rabbits at the end of one year. Okay? So there's our Fibonacci sequence. Okay. All right. So one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty one, thirty four, fifty five. Okay. Okay. So one thing we could do is we could generate another sequence by looking at the squares of the terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Okay? So look at the squares of the Fibonacci sequence. That would be one, one, four, nine, twenty-five, sixty-four, one sixty-nine, four forty-one, blah blah blah. Okay? If you take two two adjacent pairs of numbers of this sequence I generated here and add them together, any any two adjacent pairs? It's like four and nine and add them. You recognize that number? Where is that, where is that at? The other sequence. Yep. It's in, it's in the Fibonacci sequence, right? Any pair. If you do like 0, 1, and 5, 6, 1 for me, um, oh, did I go out that far? Probably not. Well, okay. Yeah, 9 and 30, 9 and 25. 34, yep. That property always holds true, okay? So that's kind of an interesting property the Fibonacci sequence has, right? Okay. Another property it has is if you look at the sequence we generate here and look at the sequence of partial sums, so the sequence of partial sums would be using this sequence. S1 is equal to 1. Just add, look at the first term. S2 is equal to 1 plus 1. S3 is the sum of the first three numbers. So what's the sum of the first three numbers going to be? 6, right? S2 
S4 would be the sum of the first four numbers of this sequence. And that's going to be um, what? 15. Do these look like Fibonacci numbers? What do you think? 1 plus 1 plus 4 is uh, 6, plus 9 is, is 15, and then uh, plus 25, well, that'd be what, 40? Do those look like Fibonacci numbers? Fibonacci numbers are buried inside, though. <laughs> 1 is 1 times 1. 2 is 2 times 1. What's 6? Three two. 3 times 2. What's 15? 3 times 5. What are the factors? Yeah, they're products of successive adjacent Fibonacci numbers, right? 5 times 8. And then the pattern continues, OK? Well, <clears throat> I could, we could look at a geometric reason why this is true, the last property. So let me go to the next slide here. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks. OK. Wait, wait. Oh, crap. <laughs> that's, oh. What, that's what I happened. That that's what that happened. Part. Oh, no, I didn't. I, uh, yeah, I didn't even. I yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't even think about now that. I don't have a job. <laughs> It'll let you off. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Oh yeah. So yeah, this is a geometric reason why that's true. Okay. Here we have a, a rectangle. Okay. And the rectangle is made up of individual squares. And you can think of the squares as being Fibonacci numbers, OK? So a one by one square, right, is, is a number one in the Fibonacci sequence. Got two of those, right? And we got a two by two square. The way we get that two by two square is just uh, you put the two one by one, one by one squares there. And that has width two. And draw another two by two square there. And then go to the right. That distance is 3, so draw your 3, three by 3 Fibonacci square there. Then go drop down. That width is 5, so draw your 5 by 5 Fibonacci square there. Then that distance is 8, and draw your 8 by 8 Fibonacci square there. And that generates a nice rectangle. Now, we can find the area of that rectangle by adding the um, areas of the individual squares. Okay. So the way you find the area of a square is just the square of the side. OK? So <clears throat> yeah, that's going to be 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared plus 8 squared. That all adds up to a grand total area of 104, right? But we also know that the area of a rectangle is length times width, right? Well, the width of that rectangle is the Fibonacci number 8, which is the sum of two adjacent Fibonacci numbers, 5 and 3. The length of that rectangle is 13, which is the sum of two adjacent Fibonacci numbers, 5 and 8. So therefore, uh, 13 times 8 is 104, which is the area of the, of the rectangle, generated by the interior areas of the squares, right? Add them all, right? OK. OK, good. All right. All right, now comes the fun part. <laughs> The golden ratio. <laughs> so the golden ratio appears in nature all over the place. And whenever the golden ratio appears, Fibonacci numbers appear. Because there's a connection between the two. Okay? And we're looking at that connection. So let's see. All right. OK. So what is the golden ratio? OK, so this is a definition. I don't know if you can see it from there back there or not. But the definition of a golden ratio is two positive numbers, A and B, where A is bigger than B, form a golden ratio, right? If the ratio of those two numbers 
A is to B, right? <coughs> is the same as the ratio of their sum to the larger of the two sides, which is A. Well, we call A over B the golden ratio, which is phi, right? We could write the right-hand side, split that fraction up as A over A plus phi over A. But A over A is just 1. B over A is the reciprocal of the, of the golden ratio, right? A over B is the golden ratio. B over A is its reciprocal. So we get this equation, right? I can solve this equation by multiplying both sides by phi. Now clear out denominators. You get a quadratic equation. We can solve that quadratic equation by either completing the square or the quadratic formula. I'm going to go ahead and solve this really quickly by completing the square. Yeah, if you don't, you've never seen this before, don't worry about it. It's all right. I just saw it first time yesterday. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Take half of negative one, which is negative a half. Square, it's a quarter. That's a perfect square. And. I can solve that by taking the square root. You get two square roots, a positive and a negative, but we don't care about the negative one because the ratio of two positive numbers is positive. And there we got the Golan ratio, okay, which is 1.61803398. It goes on forever because it's an irrational number, and irrational numbers, decimal representation never, never terminate and never repeat. Just go on forever, okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> what does this have to do with Fibonacci numbers? Well, at first glance, you can't really see. I don't think anyone can see but by, by first glance, but if we look at this equation here, which is phi is equal to 1 plus 1 over phi, and just work with that equation, we get what's called a continued fraction, okay? Phi is equal to 1 plus 1 over phi, but what's phi? What is phi? Well, it's 1 plus 1 over phi. But what's phi? <laughs> right there, it's right up there. 1 plus 1 over phi, right? So just replace phi with c. Okay, what is phi? It's 1 plus 1 over phi, okay, which is equal to and the pattern just continues, right? This goes on and on and on forever, just like the rabbits. Okay, something like that. Anyway, that's the continued fraction. So let's go ahead and look at that. And uh, right there, okay. So, all right, there's a continued fraction up there we just looked at, right? Okay. Continued fractions, any, any real number can be written as a continued fraction. Any real number, irrational, rational, whatever, okay? The difference between irrational and rational ones, well, first of all, <coughs> we got to look at the, what's the difference between a rational number and an irrational number, okay? So a rational number is a number that can be written as a ratio of two integers, hence the word rational, right? Or its decimal representation either uh, terminates or repeats. Irrational numbers are not rational, so that means they're, you cannot write them as a fraction or a ratio of two integers, and their decimal representation neither terminates nor repeats, right? Okay, so 
this phi here that we saw, wherever it was, was an irrational number because it involved square roots of five. Square root of five is an irrational number, right? Okay, all right. So this continued fraction representation of phi um, generates um, a sequence of rational numbers, okay? And that sequence of rational numbers is the, is the optimum sequence which approaches that particular irrational number. It gets there the fastest, okay? It gets there the fastest, okay? So <clears throat> the way we generate these rational numbers is just look at the first number to the left of the first addition sign. What is that number? One, okay, one. Then you look at the number to the left of the second addition sign. Well, that's one plus one over one. Well, one over one is one, so one plus one is two. Then you look at the number to the left of the three addition signs. That's one, all divided by one plus one. Well, that's two. One divided by two is a half. One plus a half is three halves, okay? And it, and it continues. But, so here, here's our fourth, here's our fourth um, rational number from the sequence. If you look at this part right here, do you see that part right there? Where do you see that? Well, that is from the term above it, isn't it? Well, what is one plus blah, blah, blah? Well, it's three halves. One divided by three halves just means the reciprocal of three halves. So that is the reciprocal of three halves, which is two thirds. One plus two thirds is five thirds, right? Do you see that number right there? What is that number? That number is five thirds. One divided by five thirds is the reciprocal of five thirds, which is three fifths. One plus three fifths is eight fifths. Do you see Fibonacci numbers? Where are the Fibonacci numbers? The numerator and denominator, right? So this continued fraction expression, which is phi, is just a ratio of Fibonacci numbers, right? See that? <laughs> that's why. That's why whenever. That's why whenever. Uh, yeah, the golden ratio appears in, in nature. So do. Fibonacci numbers, okay? Because they're connected. There's a connection there. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. I went too fast. You weren't supposed to see that. Okay. <laughs> so there's the first, ter first ten terms of uh, the sequence of ratios of Fibonacci numbers. And you can see that. What are they doing? Well, they're tending to the golden ratio, aren't they? Slowly but surely, like a snail's pace, but they're, they're getting there, OK? Let's compare that to <laughs> the continued fraction expression for, for pi, OK? So I wrote this out. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is, this is, yeah, I know some of you think about going back to Roman numerals because there's no fraction there. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> we now have a job. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So this is the continued fraction expansion for pi. And this is really easy to do. You can easily do it. And um, the continued fraction expression for a, a number tells you a lot about the number. You can examine it. You can really drill down in the number by looking at its expansion. Okay? <clears throat> and we'll talk about that. But yeah, if you have a calculator, paper, and pencil, and a lot of patience, you can do this. <laughs> it requires a lot of patience. And uh, yeah, but I, so if I could do it, anybody could do it. So um, yeah, so I wrote out this continued uh, fraction expansion, and it, it generated the sequence of rational numbers. Now, this sequence of rational numbers is the optimum sequence, meaning that these rational numbers are the best approximation for pi. That's always true. It could be proved. 
If you write out the continued rational expression for any real number, that will generate the optimum sequence of rational numbers, which means that those rational numbers get this close to that number as quickly as possible. So, okay? <laughs> so, I think you all have seen 22 over 7. That came from the continued rational the continued fraction expression for pi. That's where that came from. Okay? These, <laughs> if you look at that number right there, that is like a really good approximation of pi. Okay? Well, any, any number can has a continued rational, continued fraction expression, even, even rational numbers do. The difference being it terminates if it's a rational number. It doesn't go on forever, okay? So, like, I wrote one out here just because I was bored. There's, there's the continued rational expression for, the continued fraction expression for this rational number. I wrote it out. You can see the steps. Yep. Terminates. Okay? Irrational ones, they go forever. They don't terminate. Okay. That's all good. Now, phi is the most irrational of all irrational numbers. The golden ratio is the most irrational <laughs> of irrational numbers. What do I mean by that? Well, Jack's going to tell you. <laughs> this is Jack Nicholas from The Shining. He, put, he, put, he, uh, he was a very irrational character in that movie. And he's here. <laughs> Yeah, so if you write out a continued rational expression, a continued fraction expression for a number, yeah, you'll look like this after a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So here are my, here are my uh, rational numbers that I generated by that continued fraction expression. Remember? Look how quickly they're approaching pi. So the red highlighted ones are the significant, well, that's the accuracy of the number when you compare it to, the, to pi, right? So when you go to the, what, the fifth, yeah, the fifth number in that sequence, you're really, really, really close to the value of pi, right? If you compare that to phi, <laughs> you go out to the fifth term, it's only accurate to the first decimal place, right? So what, that, what does that tell you? Well. It tells you that phi is really re resistant to being approximated by rational numbers. It doesn't like it, right? It doesn't like it. Whereas pi, it's open to being approximated by rational numbers. Okay? <laughs> phi isn't. It's, it is, that's why it's the most irrational of all rational numbers. Well, why is that? Well, I'll show you why. It's all right here. If you look at the continued fraction expression for phi, all the denominators are 1. That tells you the convergence is going to be really, really slow. Where, as if you look at what's really crazy, I'll show you something that's really crazy. <laughs> OK. If you look at the, this one for pi, see the denominators are really large. So the convergence is really going to be large. It's going to get there really quickly. It's going to jump right out that number that's approximating real quickly. Okay? So, what's really crazy? Now, why is why is uh, yeah yeah why is phi the most irrational number? Well, one is the smallest positive integer, so these denominators are going to be the smallest, which means its convergence is going to be the smallest. It's going to be the slowest, okay? It's going to converge to that irrational number the slowest, okay? Of any, of any <laughs> irrational numbers, okay? So that's why it's the most irrational of all irrational numbers, okay? <laughs> okay. What's wild about that, though, is that all, all phi is is 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2.
So if you add 1 to square root 5, square root 5 is an irrational number. 1 is rational, 2 is rational. So if you add 1, a rational number, to square root 5 and divide that mess by 2, a rational number, you get something that's really, really irrational. So 5 is equal to 2 plus um, 1 plus, what is that expansion? It has a nice periodic behavior to it. I did, I did this earlier. So what are all the denominators here? They're all 4, right? Well, that means its convergence is going to be really fast. So if you look at, if you generate the, the, uh, part, the you generate the fractions from its continued fraction expression, you look at the, the fifth number, which is 682 divided by 305. That's within seven decimal places of square root 5. It's only the fifth number in the sequence. It's because the denominators are really large. Well, not really large, they're bigger than one. So it's a converge really fast. Okay? So that explains why phi is the most irrational of irrational numbers. Well, why does that have anything to do with anything? Well, here is an application of that. Sunflowers, right? <coughs> if you were to look really, really closely here, It to really, really close, and it might give you a headache if you look too closely. But you get, you get, you get spirals, right? And these are Fibonacci spirals, which I, I was going to talk about that, but I forgot. Um, spirals. So you have spiral patterns going counterclockwise, and then you have spiral patterns spinning clockwise. If you look at that really carefully, okay? What that does, it's nature's way of, it's nature's way of a maximizing the number of seeds per square or per unit area. It maximizes the number of seeds per unit area. It's nature's way of doing that. Any other pattern, you could see that there's no way you could put another seed in there. That, all the space is used, right? What dictates the path of growth of these seeds is what's called the divergence angle. The divergence angle for this flower head and other flower heads self-similar to this is the golden ratio. And if you took any other number for the divergence angle, you would get a different pattern. So since that's the golden ratio, if you were to count the number of spirals going counterclockwise, you would get a Fibonacci number. Spinning clockwise, you'd also get a Fibonacci number. I didn't do that because I don't have that kind of patience, but you would. <laughs> you would get a Fibonacci number, OK? Well, why is, why is the golden ratio the optimum angle? It all has to do with the golden ratio being the most irrational of irrational numbers. It's that slow convergence is what does it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, 30 plus 15 is 45. I think, I think I'm almost, uh, almost done. But I want to show you the, the spiral, right? Look, 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 I'll, show you, I'll show you the spiral. That's kind of cool. I think you'll like it. I like it. So like, obviously, you'll like it. OK. All right. All right. So Fibonacci squares, right? So here's the one by one Fibonacci square here. If you mark off a unit and drew an arc, a circular arc, using a compass, and do that for every Fibonacci square, you would get this spiral. Okay? It's called the Fibonacci spiral. Okay? Fibonacci spirals come up in nature. Right? Here is, here's Ian. Here's Ian. Okay. You, can see, you can see that the cloud patterns, the uh, pinwheel spiral patterns, can be modeled by the Fibonacci spiral. Yeah. And this also models like Nautilus shells. And uh, where else in nature does it come up? Nautilus shells, oh, flower heads. Right? Spiral galaxies. 
spiral galaxies can be modeled by Fibonacci spirals. Come up in nature, so. Well, anyway, I hope you learned something. I had fun. Well, that's all that matters. Really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>